Parotid tumor and relation to breast cancer as well. We have a female patient who had a pleomorphic adenoma and she underwent parotidectomy that was done. And she was diagnosed with breast cancer as well. A mastectomy was done and she is not presenting, she is now presenting with uh, neck swelling. Okay, so I'm going to ask a few questions um, about the um, parotid tumors and its relation to the breast cancer as well. What is a pathological test to rule out cervical lymph node? So usually we can do a few pathological tests to uh, look for the cervical lymph node. Um, I think we answered a pretty similar question to that. So we can usually investigate lymph node by doing some imaging or doing biopsy or tissue biopsy. Biopsy can be a fine needle aspiration cytology, can be a core biopsy, can be an excision biopsy, and can be a sentinel lymph node biopsy. But here we can talk about the fine needle aspiration cytology and also a true cut biopsy. The advantage of fine needle aspiration cytology, so usually we have a small needle, a very small needle, that we inject into the tumor and take a few samples, very scanty amount, right? But the advantage to that is it's being done under ultrasound and can be done in outpatient clinic and the results are quite rapid, right? And it's a very minor procedure, can be done under local anesthetic and sometimes you can, you can even skip using local anesthetic because it's exactly like a cannula with a very small needle. How do the embolus from a tumor survive in the lymph node? So usually the, uh, the tumor... Um, cells when they go to a lymph node, there will be secretion of something called vascular endothelial growth factor, alpha, all right? So from the name, it's vascular endothelial growth factor. So it leads to formation of new blood vessels. So it will cause something called angiogenesis. And that will be the source of the blood supply for this tumor cell, which will be able to survive. That's why sometimes even embolization is um, a good stage for uh, dealing with tumors. So, for example, if you have a meningioma, uh, a brain meningioma, you can do a meningeal artery uh, embolization for this meningioma to shrink in size before you remove it. Okay. All right. Why erosion of the carotid artery uh, by a tumor will not form a blood clot? So, carotid artery is one of the biggest arteries in the body, and it has very high blood pressure. So, very high blood pressure, and that means uh, uh, the uh, probability of formation of a blood clot is quite less. And also the surrounding tissue, if you have a tumor metastasis in the surrounding tissue, so um, there will be some sort of tissue necrosis and the tissue will be very fragile around that tumor. What is the relationship between uh, breast and parotid uh, um, cancer or adenocarcinoma? So from the name, they are both adenocarcinoma. So we're talking about two glands. So obviously the parotid gland is, is a gland and the breast is some sort of um, apocrine, modified apocrine esophageal gland. So they are both glandular tumor. And both of them can express some certain hormones or receptors. For example, the tumor suppressor gene and HER, human epidermal growth factor 2, HER, and also uh, uh, the uh, androgen receptor or EGFR, which we mentioned here. And there is something called the base, which is breast cancer and salivary gland expression, right? Which is both, both present in breast and parotid cancer as well. The commonest cause of parotid uh, benign swelling is uh, the pleomorphic adenoma. What does the word pleomorphic mean? Pleo means multi, and morphic is basically variation in the shape. So you have variability in the size and the shape and the staining of the nuclei of the cells. So let's say if this is the parotid gland, if it looks like that, right? If this is the parotid gland, and obviously it will be covered from the outside by skin, and inside the parotid gland, which we explained in anatomy, you have the facial uh, uh, nerve, and you have the uh, external carotid artery and retromandibular vein as well. So if you have a, a malignant tumor in here, and we talked about the criteria of malignant tumor, usually irregular and not capsulated, so no capsule, and can cause invasion of the surrounding structure. So the, the hallmark here is this invasion. 
So the tumor will start to invade the deeper tissue, including even the blood vessel and the facial nerve, causing facial nerve palsy, and the skin over the parotid gland as well. And um, it will have some sort of rapid increase inside because this is malignant. Types of parotid tumor, like we said, when we're being asked this question anywhere in the pathology section, we need to say whether it's a benign or malignant. A malignant could always be primary and secondary for metastasis. So benign, we're going to mention a few examples, such as pleomorphic adenoma, a malignant, uh, such as mucopyramoid carcinoma, arsenic cell carcinoma, or adenocarcinoma as well. The features of malignant cells. It's not malignant mass. We're talking about malignant cell, all right? So normally, we have, let's say we have multiple cells. They all have a similar shape in a tissue, similar shape with a nucleus that's coming in certain size, and these cells are, no, are under complete and continuous turnover all the time, all right? So we have cells in here. Let's assume they all look the same, look very similar, and you have the nucleus which will be in the center with a specific NC ratio, specific NC ratio. The NC ratio is the nucleus over the cellular ratio. So you're basically measuring the diameter of the nucleus, and the diameter of the whole cell, and uh, that would be the ratio in between them. So normally it's like that, and there is no invasion of the surrounding structure. There is usually each cell is respecting the surrounding cells without any sort of invasion. All right? So in malignancy, what will happen is there will be invasion of the surrounding structures, and the cells will look different. So you have a big cell, just like that, and then you will have a very small one, just like that, and then another one that is polygonal, and then another one like that, multiple cells. Even some of them can be multinucleated. Most important part is the nucleus. The nucleus will be a little bit larger, and since it's larger, it's able to be stained more, so it will be hyperchromatic nucleus. So, one, so lack of differentiation, it's not differentiated anymore, it doesn't look similar to its own tissue. Increased mitotic rate, continuous uh, division of the cell, and anaplasia. Anaplasia basically means loss of the normal structure of the cell, and the cells will be arranged very haphazardly. Pleomorphism, they have different shapes, hyperchromatic and giant nucleus. One is giant nucleus and hyperchromatic nucleus with increased NC ratio as well. So this is the way I try to remember things in relation to the criteria of malignant cells. Again, that's a, a very similar questions, but, um, question, but it's answered in a different way. So what are the cytological and histological features of malignancy? We mentioned the cytological, which are, you know, remember, uh, different cells with big, big nucleus. So you have pleomorphism and hyperchromatic nuclei, giant nucleus. So again, you will find here pleomorphism, hyperchromatic nuclei, Increased NG, NG, uh, NC ratio, large prominent nucleus, and increased mitotic rate, loss of differentiation. It's basically the same thing, but it's written in a different way. And histological structure, so loss of the normal tissue. It's not cellular here, tissue architecture, and the invasion beyond the basement membrane. So basically, if you have this at the basement membrane, you will have multiple cells in here, all right? So there will be some sort of invasion to this basement membrane, and also there might be some sort of necrosis and hemorrhage as well. What is the best test to differentiate benign and malignant cells? So from what we saw here, the cytology will be the best test to do that, and it does have high sensitivity and high specificity as well. High sensitivity means the ability to rule in, to diagnose, to confirm the diagnosis. Specificity is your ability to rule out, to say, well, this is definitely not cancer, or uh, most likely not cancer. Okay, so differentiation between cytology and histology, which, which is, is pretty um, um, clear in here. So cytology is the study of the features and the function of the cells. Okay? And this is a study, the function or the tissue, the, the tissue shape. So here we're looking at the whole tissue, but here you're looking on a cellular level, all right? So studying the, the tissue structure and function, and here is studying the tissue under 
the microscope. How to rule out malignancy intraoperatively? We can do that by doing something called frozen section. And frozen section, you take the tissue or the sample or the biopsy and put it into a glass rod and suddenly get it down to uh, minus 20 to minus 30 degree, send it to the lab, and cut it with the micro tome and start looking under the microscope for the presence of cancer. So we're going to talk about the uh, um, uh, frozen section in a little bit more detail in the next scenario. Yeah, so we're going to continue with peptic ulcer in the next time.